Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. This is Maude, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Brandt just stepped into the office. Oh, good. I'll connect you. Hello, Johnny. I'm sorry I was out when you called, Mr. Brandt. Your secretary mentioned a fire you wanted me to look into. Yeah, that's right. And we got the report about a half hour ago. If you hurry, you can be there when the fire inspector decides the cause. How serious is it? I don't know. I couldn't learn whether anybody was in the building or not. It's a recreation club on the outskirts of Waterbury. The Monopoly, Trent Street. Okay, Mr. Brandt. I'll take a run out and let you know what I find. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Friends, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum present these weekly adventures of Johnny Dollar because they know that millions of you enjoy Johnny Dollar. That's true of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, too. It's enjoyed by millions, day in and day out. People find that chewing on a smooth, delicious piece of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum somehow makes time pass more pleasantly. Whether you're working, driving, shopping, or just taking things easy, that good, tasty chewing gives you enjoyment and satisfaction. So always keep a package of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. And whenever you want a refreshing, delicious treat... Chew a stick. You'll like it. You really will. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Corinthian All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Monopoly matter. Expense account item one, $26.70. Car rental and mileage between my Hartford apartment and what was left of the Monopoly Club in Waterbury. Where's Mitchell? Where's Mitchell? There'll be more men over here. Get Mitchell. We're losing pressure at number three. Take the job, Hey, you men, that wall's gone! Come out of there! Get out of there! An hour and a half after I got there, the fight was pretty well over. Just a couple of men with a high-pressure hose putting the final touches to a few smoking timbers. Hey! Hey, you there! We'll let you through the ropes. I'm from the insurance company that covers this place. Oh? Uh, you carrying credentials? Yeah. See him? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, here. You have to be careful. Has the fire inspector shown up yet? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's him over there. One walking away from the two men. Captain McCready. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Captain McCready? Yes? My name is Dollar. I've been hired by the insurance company to investigate the fire. Come along. The men who answered the call first tell me it broke out inside on the ground floor. Anybody in the building? Not that we know of. No report of anybody. Now, let's see. The window is over there. The smoke was reported coming out of there first. Uh, Owsler! Yes, sir? Have a couple of men bring axes over here, will you? Yes, sir. Do you specialize in fire cases, Mr. Dollar? No, but I've worked a few. Well, here we have a new building, not over five or six years old, that had passed all fire inspections when it got a license to operate as a place of public assembly. What do you want, Captain? Oh, uh, you'll find some sash weights over there at the base of the wall. That's where a window was. Clear the debris down to the cement in a triangle, but that is the point. Spreading this way. Yes. That must be here. You're looking for anything special, Captain? Point of origin. Smoke was spotted first coming out the window. 
Was it open? And if so, why? Yeah, cold weather like this. Was the club operating? No. It didn't open till 2 in the afternoon. We got the alarm at 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. You know anything about this Gerald Hobson who owns the place? Nothing yet. He was here, but before I was, he went home. Let's go over here and see what the men find, if anything. What we found pointed without a doubt to arson. Bits of broken bottles, the remnants of unburned cloth. Charred as the evidence was, the cause of the fire was fairly obvious. We used to call them Molotov cocktails. Bottles filled with gasoline or oil with a piece of cloth for a wick. One or more evidently had been thrown in through the window. And the damage to the frame building was over 90%. The closest neighboring building was a garage almost 100 yards away. We questioned the people there and then Captain McGreedy went back to his office. I looked up the owner of the Monopoly Club, Mr. Gerald Hobson. From the insurance company? Yes, uh, looking into the cause of the fire. Oh, of course. Well, come in. Thanks. Uh, May I take your coat? Oh, I won't be here long. I'll keep it on. Well, just just come into the other room and sit down. I looked for you out at your building, but I guess you'd left before I got there. Yes, I I was there, of course. Bob at the garage, he called me about the fire. He's the one that reported it. Yes, I talked with him. And I went right out, but my nerves aren't what they were once. Fire is such a terrible thing. I... I didn't know what to do when I asked one of the firemen off, and he told me to go home. That people wanted to know where to find me. Uh, did they save anything? Nothing but the foundations and some plumbing. Oh, well, then thank heaven for the insurance. <laughs> well, uh, I don't suppose you share my feeling about that. You've paid the premiums, Mr. Hobson. Now, uh, I'd like you to answer some questions about your club. Yes, of course. I, don't... I understand it was a licensed place of public amusement. What kind of amusement? Well, we specialized in Monopoly. In what? Uh, the game, you know. Oh, sure. Well, we have a great many factory workers in Waterbury. Well, I started the Monopoly Club almost, oh, must have been three years ago, to offer them harmless entertainment and relaxation. The game was quite popular. <laughs> Enabled them to play a financier, you know. Oh, yeah, I remember the game Yes, you buy yeah. and sell and try to amass a fortune. We ran month-long tournaments and... Oh, I tell you, some of the fortunes were astronomical. Well, they were just billions. <laughs> was there any other amusement offered? Well, I had a few tables for the card players. There were soft drinks and candies. And... Mr. Hobson, I want you to understand that I'm not a police officer. Anything you tell me will be kept in confidence. Oh, yes, of course. I'm... Did you run any gambling games? Why, of course not. My club was a decent legal establishment. The members were good, everyday working people. And, and your income came solely from memberships? From memberships and retail sales. Uh, I don't like your intimations. Not one bit. I'm looking for a reason why somebody should have set fire to your sure. building. That's why the gambling possibility crossed my mind. Heavy losses could drive somebody to it. Yes. You were absolutely sure that the fire was not accidental? The fire inspector, Captain McGrady, seemed entirely satisfied. I saw the evidence, too. Uh, Have you spoken to the police about this, Mr. Dollar? I know I haven't. Why do you ask? Well, a a man came to see me a week before last. Uh, On Monday, it wasn't. I was just opening up the club, and so I was the only one there. It was one of those protection rackets, and he demanded money and made threats. You told the police about it? Of course, immediately. What did you say to this man? Well, I gave him $100 to get rid of him. That was to be the fee per month. As he put it, I'd better cooperate and keep my mouth shut or he'd put me out of business for good. Well, did the police come to see you? Yes, two officers came right out to the club. I told them I'd rather meet them someplace else, but they said the faster they got on his trail, the quicker they'd find him. Well, they didn't find him at all. And if somebody threw gasoline into my place, it stands to reason that 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 man must be the one. Uh Uh-huh. Well, if you let me use your phone, Mr. Hobson, I'll call Captain McCready. We'll see what we can make out of this. Yes, of course. It's right out here in the hall. Sorry, I missed your phone call, Dollar, but I had a meeting with Chief Blair. Oh, it worked out fine, Captain. Gave me time for a sandwich. Good. Oh, uh, Sergeant Winnick of the police bunco squad came over. He just stepped out of the room for a moment. I'm naturally requesting an investigation from the city fire attorney, but now with the possibility of extortion, the police can start their own right away. 
That'll speed things up. Do you have anything else? Well, the lab isn't finished with the evidence yet, but so far there are traces Sorry of three so bottles. Long, oh, uh, Sergeant Winnick, this is Mr. Dollar. How are you, Sergeant? Nice to know you, Mr. Dollar. Now sit down. You, uh, you talked to this Mr. Hobson? Yeah. How did the subject of this man and his threat come up? When I told him how the fire started. Hmm. I don't know what to make of it. I got out the report on that call we made at his club. Two of our men were there 15 minutes after he phoned. And Hobson's description of the man had been radioed to every squad car on the streets. You didn't get any place on it? No. We haven't had a complaint from anybody else in town on anything like it. If a protection racket was building, you'd think we'd get more than one call, wouldn't you? You think Hobson's report was untrue, then, huh? We closed the investigation on the theory that a tranchant had taken him for a hundred bucks on a protection scare. Now I'm... I'm not so sure. You haven't checked on Hobson? Not yet. But I think we should. I'd be glad to have you along. Well, thanks. Then I guess we don't have to take up any more of the captain's time. Arson cases are among the toughest to crack. You're faced with the fact that the fire usually destroys the implicating evidence. But there was some evidence that the fire could not destroy. I faced Gerald Hobson with it that night. It was nice of you to come back, Mr. Dollar, to trouble yourself like this. You probably won't appreciate it when you've heard me out. Was that so? Why not? Well, to put it bluntly, you're under suspicion of setting the torch to your club. I'm as... Oh, Are you out of your mind? What's the meaning of this? I spent most of the afternoon with the police. A Sergeant Winnick investigated your complaint a couple of weeks back. Your story of the protection threat didn't seem to hold up. Now, let me understand this. They think I was lying about that man? Oh, I don't think they'd say so in But they do, huh? Then why aren't they here? Because they're a lot more cautious than I am. Maybe I'm overstepping my bounds by coming, but I like to have things out in the open. I want to show you what's stacked up against you if you try to press a claim against the insurance company. Oh, yes, of course. I'd forgotten your sole interest is in saving your company's money. Oh, yes, by hook or crook. I'll be your best witness if the situation clears up in your favor. But, uh, I did some snooping. I looked into some of your financial affairs. Get out of here! Sure, sure. This is your castle, Mr. Hobson. This kind of privacy I have no right to invade. But the fact that $18,000 would save your financial neck is not private information anymore. Well, that's where I left it and drove the 25 miles back to Hartford in my apartment. And that's where it stayed until the phone interrupted my first cup of coffee the next morning at 10.30. Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Winnick in Waterbury. Oh, yes, yeah, Sergeant. What's new? Did you jump on Hobson last night like you said you were going to? Yeah, I needled him a little. You should have saved it. The picture's changed. Hobson's story is on the level. Oh. Well, I've been wrong before. Another protection threat. About 20 minutes ago in a bowling alley at 783 Sheridan. It ended in a shooting. One man dead, another wounded. If you're coming over, I'll meet you there. Yeah. Thanks for the call, Sergeant. I'll get started right away. Friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Even when you're busy working... You can slip a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint in your mouth and enjoy that pleasant chewing. The lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps relieve pent-up tension, gives you satisfaction. As a result, you seem to feel more relaxed and get more enjoyment out of what you're doing. So enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint gum while you work and at other times, too. Get a few packages next time you're at the store. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, 
we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. traffic. Any other developments? Come on inside. The dead man was a bystander. They just took his body down. Yeah, the old timer over there is Con Robleski. He owns the place. He shot one of the toughs. He's pretty upset. There were two of them? Yeah. The other one made a run. No, no, look. I am good man. Where is Officer Dubek? You don't have anything to worry about, Mr. Robleski. Who? Who is this? Uh, he's not a policeman. Uh, he's Mr. Dollar, a friend of mine. I'm sorry to hear about your trouble, Mr. Robleski. Oh, so much trouble in the world. Why there be this in my city? But I have right. I shoot this man, but I don't do wrong. Yeah, that's what I understand. They were threatening you, weren't they? They say I am foreigner. They say I pay them to work in my city. I say no. He say he fix my place like he fix some other. The Monopoly Club? Was that the name? Yes, I do not know this place, I tell him. They say, you stupid old man, you get burned down. Then my friend Carl come in. He say loud, what is? He knew something was wrong. Uh, he see me mad. They turn to him. I open drawer for gun. Carl come close to fight. Then this other, he has gun. And he shoot Carl. Then this other, he turn to me and I shoot. But the one that shot Carl got away. He run. Now they say Carl is dead for trying to help me. It's wrong, my friend, to be dead. Why this be? This be good world. Why so much trouble for people? Oh, why? That's about Too it, much Colin. trouble for good yeah. world. I take it they came in while he was opening up. Yeah, that's right. He was alone, just about like Hobson's club. The wounded man, was he conscious? Yeah, suffering from shock. So he wasn't worth anything. According to his wallet, he's Paul Loner with an address in Chicago, 21 years old. Anybody spot the other one? A newsboy across the street saw him come out and run south. Not much of a description, but it fit what Robleski gave us. Roads and railways ought to be covered by now. Yeah, they were stopping cars when I came in. Yeah, Lieutenant Glass is in charge. The old war horse can get things done in a hurry if he feels like it. i better get that car out of the middle of the street. Yeah. Uh, Loner's over at Central Emergency Hospital. We might as well go over there and wait till he can make a statement. They tell us you're strong enough to talk, Loner. Ah, well, they told me to, but I don't see no reason to. You're doing plenty of talking in the bowling alley from what we hear. I don't remember. I don't blame you. Pushing an old man around like that must be something you'd really want to forget. Now, go start up a parish someplace, will you? How many times have you been arrested, Loner? What difference does that make? After hearing you blab while you were passed out, they want to see how many lies you'll tell now. I didn't pass. No, you just don't remember you know what time it is now? I don't care what time it is. It's after four. You were out for over an hour. You don't bluff very good. Your wife's name is Edith. How's that for bluffing? Where is your wife? Oh, leave me alone. I hurt. The doctor said you were in good shape. It's a laugh. If you weren't, he wouldn't have let us in here. Where's your wife? I don't know. Look, you're wasting your time. I don't want to talk, and I won't. That old man you shot is dead. Did you know that? I didn't shoot nobody. What? Right. I didn't have a gun. It was right there on the floor beside you. You're a dirty, stinking liar. I didn't have a gun. The guy that was with me, that was his gun. He shot the old man, and you know. The report says you were there alone. That's a lie. Who was with you? The guy I teamed up with. I don't know his name. If you can prove that, it might make a difference. Can you prove it? It's true. That, that old guy, that Robleski, he knows it. He said you were alone. It's a lie. You're lying. If he said it, he's lying. Why should we lie? To frame me. I didn't kill him. Why should Robleski lie? I don't know, but he is. And if you guys want to, you can make him say he's lying. Maybe he wants to be sure somebody gets the electric chair for killing his friend. As long as we've got you, 
You all right? He knows I had a partner. My partner did most of the talk. Who was your partner? I don't know. Robleski says you talked to him. I didn't. I tell you, I didn't. Bert Lucas did the talking? Yes, Bert. You dirty rotten. Take it easy, Lona. You knew Lucas was with me. Now we know. Well, Sergeant, that's a little more. Yeah. I'll get verification of Lucas' name and description over to the radio office if you hang on here. Oh, Mr. Hobson, come on in. Oh, I'm sorry to... Well, that's all right. Come on in. You remember Mr. Dollar? Oh, yes. I'll meet you in my office, Dollar. Yeah, I'll get there as fast as I can. Well, I owe you an apology, Mr. Hobson. Oh, no. Oh, please. No, it's your job to look into things. I... I shouldn't have lost my temper. Thanks. Now, will you take a look at this man? Well, yes. That's correct. Is he the one you gave the hundred dollars to? No. No, I've never seen this man. You're sure? Yes, I'm positive. Did Lucas do the talking at the Monopoly Club, too, Loner? He didn't have to talk much with this jerk. Oh, no. Uh, never mind, Mr. Hobson. Who touched off the building? You, or Lucas, or both of you? What's the difference? I want to know. I don't see what difference it makes now, but we both did. We did it because this jerk Hobson here went to the cops. Bert should have squeezed 500 out of you, then we'd been out of this time. Oh. Well, that, that's all for now, Mr. Hobson. We'll call you down again when we pick up his partner. Well, that'll take some doing. Bert's still on his feet. That puts him way out of your client. Oh, he's a vicious type of person. Yes. Here, here this way. Oh. Oh. Mr. Dollar. Yes? I will contact you later, Mr. Hobson. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Dollar. nurse. Thank you. Maybe you better take this call. I've been trying to reach Sergeant Winnick, but he's not in his office yet. Well, sure. What is it? It's Lona's wife. She wants to talk to somebody who's seen her husband. Oh? Where can I take it? Right over here. Okay. Hello? 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 Who is this? This is Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Lona. Oh, he's all right. He's going to make it fine. Oh, when did you see him? I just left him. We, uh, we talked about you. Where are you now, Mrs. Loner? I'm just down the street. I started out to come right down to see him when I read it, but when I got close, I, I got scared. Well, you have nothing to be afraid of, have you? People will ask me questions, and I'm not going to lie no more. You'll think it's wrong, but I know it's right. Of course it is. Could I meet you someplace? Oh, no. But if you'll wait outside the door for me so I won't have to talk to those men who don't care about anybody... I'll be there. I'm so mixed up, Mr. Dollar. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. But I always knew that something as bad as this was going to happen... I always knew when it happened, I'd have to do something. The fellow who was with him, his name, Bert Lucas. Yeah, we learned that. The police here phoned the police in Chicago and learned about him and about you. And about how you and your husband left. They weren't sure Bert Lucas was here. But we found out from your husband. Oh, I, I know where Bert Lucas is hiding. Where? I, I can't tell you by streets and roads, but... In a car, I could tell you how to drive there. How can you be sure he's there? He came by where we live after he got away from that trouble this morning. He didn't know Paul was hit. He said him and Paul got separated, and he was going out to that place that got burned down. The Monopoly Club? I'm killing him when I tell you this. Not necessarily, Mrs. Lona. Oh, yes, I am. He knows he killed that man. He told me so. He said he'd never give himself up, but I don't care. He's in a cellar out there. That's where he is. He was going to wait till dark, but he's in a cellar out there. Seventy-three. Calling car seventy-three. Ignore previous call and return to your station. Car fifty. Five oh. What is your present location? Car 5 proceeding west on Trent Street between Hudson and Pine. Proceed to the Monopoly Club and stand by. Monopoly Club. Roger. Now, that's Burnett's car. He has three men with him. Lucas may be hearing these cars. 
Any more might scare him out. Yeah. I think we better move in. I'll leave one man here with the searchlights in case we need him. Hi, Burnett. You have a Thompson? Two of them, Sergeant. Good. And it's dark. You may try to run for it. Leave one of your men here in case we need some light. Right. Hillary, get the search trained on the wreckage and be ready if we need it. Well, right. you've been here before, Dollar. I haven't. I didn't spot any cellar. Oh. All right. Two Thompsons on each end. And we'll move straight in quickly until we get to the wreckage. He's on. Any stairway to the cellar must be in one of those two corners at the back wall there. Uh huh. They must hear us by now. I'm going to give them a call. Lucas! Come on out, Lucas! Let's move forward. Really? He hit one of your men. Get down. Get down, Bernard! Sergeant? How bad? In the stomach, Sergeant. He's passed out. I saw the muzzle flashes, Sergeant. Back there. Where you can see that timber at an angle. Uh, I thought it was farther to the left. Hillary! Light! Burnett! Cover me! Right. All right, Lucas. Come on out before you blast it out. He won't come out, Sergeant. He's in too deep to... There he goes! Lucas, stop! You'll lose him! Burnett, stop him! Expense account item two, $35.50, miscellaneous, food, extra mileage, etc., etc. Expense account total, $62.20. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum is a refreshing, delicious treat you can enjoy just about any time. Chew a few sticks of Wrigley's Spearmint during the day and see how the good chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum cools your mouth, freshens your taste, and sweetens your breath. The chewing itself gives you a nice little boost, helps you keep going at your best. Millions of people get real chewing enjoyment out of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. And we know that you'll enjoy it, too. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Sammy Hill, Bill Johnstone, Stacey Harris, Parley Bear, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, Joe Duvall, and Jeanette Nolan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network.